Hi folks, and welcome to Changing Minds, a new webinar series that uses psychology and neuroscience to better understand human behavior. My name is Joe Devlin, and I'm a professor of cognitive neuroscience at UCL. I'll be hosting the series. Because it's a new program, I wanted to take a moment to just explain the format. Each week, we'll explore the behavioral science behind some of the most pressing issues of the day, panic buying, social distancing, dealing with uncertainty, and today's topic, working from home. Each week, I'll be joined by an expert who will share their insights and top tips. We want the program to be as interactive as possible, so I encourage everyone to share your questions on the Q&A board. We'll try to get to as many as possible. We really value your input, so please do share those questions. Let's get started. With me today is Anna Cox, Professor of Human Computer Interaction and Vice Dean of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at UCL. Welcome to Changing Minds, Anna. Oh no, I still don't have sound. Okay, that's me, it's fine. <laughs> Brilliant, okay, fantastic. Well, given that this is our first go, we're gonna assume that there'll be some technical gremlins and I'll figure things out as we go. Well, as I say, welcome to Changing Minds, Anna. Glad to have Thanks, you. it's good to be here. Today we'll be discussing how to make the best of working from home, a situation we all suddenly find ourselves in. And I'd like to begin by asking you about your experience, Anna. What's working from home been like for you? Okay, so um, probably for the last 15 or so years, I've worked at home at least one day a week. Um, and ordinarily, I work at home a couple of days a week. And I find it pretty easy to do. Um, I've got, you know, space at home in which to work. Um, and normally, there's no one else here. So, um, you know, it's like my own world. <laughs> and uh, but now, of course, it's really different because at the moment I have my partner at home working, who's also an academic, and uh, I have two children, um, a teenager and a tween. Wow. So it sounds like it's a pretty busy house then, I imagine. Yeah. So we've um, we've managed to make space for everyone to have some desk space. Um, but and that works really well when uh, when everyone's doing silent work, I suppose. But um, and then for the you know for a lot of the time that's the way it is. So the the two children are both being sent work from school, and uh, the one who's at secondary school is following the normal school timetable, and has some live lessons which are quite interesting because I wouldn't know it was a live lesson until he's asked by a teacher to say something and then all of a sudden I hear this little voice going over my shoulder um but of course when you know I'm doing this or having one of a million uh Skype or Zoom meetings um it, it's really different then so um we can't all be in the same room if we're trying to do that. So we're having to use our space really flexibly. Yeah, that sounds very much like our experience in our house. Um, although I don't normally work from home, I'm learning to, to love it. And today I hope to learn to love it even a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned is actually uh, my experience too, right? Is that I have this massive increase in different types of online messaging, Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, you name it. Do you have any advice on how we should best try to deal with these? Well, I think um, one strategy that's worked really well for me um, in terms of organizing myself ordinarily for working at home is that I tend to keep all my meetings on the days I'm in the office so that the days I'm at home, I can do focused work. And I even um, think about if I'm at home for two days, I might think about those two days in quite different ways. One when I might try really to do research type work and one when I'm doing has teaching and admin work. So I think one of the things that I've certainly experienced over the past couple of weeks, whilst we've all been working at home and, and that has, it's not just the fact we're working at home, but we're all dealing with a whole load of new work, having to, you know, change the way we do things and, um, but academics move our teaching online. And I'm sure for people in other professions, they're also doing new things, new jobs. That means more meetings. And so my meetings are now sprinkled throughout the week and, and having that boundary between 
my focused work days and my meeting days is much harder for me to um, to have that right at the moment but it's definitely something that I want to try to um, put back in place I guess over the coming few weeks and it it kind of um, relates a bit to a study we did quite a few years ago where we were looking at people and how best to manage their email because email is definitely one of those things that can spread throughout your entire day and uh, we conducted a study where we asked people to try to limit how often they interacted with their email so we had uh, some people who um, were in our control group just did what they normally did uh, we had and we had some people who we asked them to do to try and limit their email to just once a day and first of all we discovered people found that really hard to do so this was like a field study right so we're trying to do this in real life and it's a difficult strategy for people to adopt straight away um, but what we did found was they were successful in reducing the number of times they visited their inbox and also quite interestingly the amount of time they spent in their inbox so we saw that by um, reducing the number of times you visit you actually become more efficient with the way that you deal with your email and this has an, an extra bonus if you like so the fewer times that you interrupt yourself by going to look at your email um, the fewer times you have to return back to your primary task the thing that you were supposed to be working on we know that every time you interrupt yourself and you come back there's a time cost to trying to get back into where you were so if you minimize the number of times you interrupt yourself you're going to not only be more efficient dealing with your email but also be more efficient at getting on with your primary task oh fantastic so if you can limit that kind of multitasking of which probably we don't think of email that way a lot but it is right you're switching from what you're doing to something yeah. else then yeah. you're going to improve productivity across the board yeah and, and so we would expect that kind of finding to generalize to other types of task switching as well so we've done lots of studies looking at task switching both in the lab and in the field and um and yeah we just we see the same um picture across lots of different scenarios at the fewer times you are interrupted or you self-interrupt, the better. Fantastic. All right. And I assume that applies just as much to meetings, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's why I think that if you can try to get all your meetings on one day um, and not have them scattered throughout your week, it gives you, um, you know, some clear time then to think about what you're going to do on those other days and have those um, sort of like really have time to concentrate on the stuff that you feel is important. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense and it sort of feels like my experience too. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about a, another recent study that you ran. So you had um, a study that you looked at working from home in, in crowd workers and you gained some, you know, insight again in this field study about what, you know, what their insights are. And I wondered if you could tell us about that. I wonder if you wouldn't mind starting by just explaining what is a crowd worker? Sure. So um, that there are lots of different crowd workers. Um, but one, the, the people we were looking for, uh, looking at were people who worked on a particular platform called Amazon Mechanical Turk. And uh, these people are paid to do small bits of work. Lots of their work involves um, labeling photographs um, or so for example um, when Amazon want to put on a new product um, they have lots of images of their uh, of their products that they want on their website and they basically got humans to do this labeling task so it's something you can make into a really tiny task and then you can pay people a really tiny amount of money to do it um, and these people also do other types of tasks. So they might um, be transcribing from scanned documents or filling out questionnaires. And in fact, a lot of um, psychology studies are done using these kind of online work platforms. Um, but we conducted a study where we asked people to 
fill out a questionnaire telling us about uh, their work environment. Um, we we gave them a series of different questionnaires in our survey, including um, questionnaires that help us understand how they manage their work-life boundaries, um, how stressed they feel about their work and so on. And since then, we've also done further studies where we have been um, asked, we've asked people to, to take a screen recording of themselves working so we can actually see what they're doing when they're working. And we found all sorts of interesting things, um, particularly around the challenges that they experience in working at home. So lots of these people work at home, not all of them. Some of them are also doing another job. So for example, imagine someone who sits on um, the reception desk at a building. Um, when they haven't got people coming in and out, they might sit there working on an Amazon Mechanical Turk as well. Um, so these people are often switching between uh, lots of, you know, between different um, tasks in that kind of situation. And they are also um, trying to keep an eye on what other work is coming up. So they're looking at um, kind of like a stream of what jobs are coming up so they can pick their next one. So they're getting ready for what, what other job might they do later. And um, when we looked at what they did and how they managed everything, we saw that as well as this sort of multitasking thing that we saw going on, there were all sorts of other distractions they had in their environment. Um, and the ones that you might imagine if one's experiencing now, so definitely people and pets definitely interrupt people. Um, but there are also digital distractions, so people's email popping up, um, other things that might um, you know, they might get an instant message from somebody. Um, and they also talked to us about um, how they had to work at all sorts of different times of the day and some of the challenges that that created. Fantastic. So it sounds like it's a massive multitasking problem. Um, and then there's also these boundary issues that are going on, not just in terms of life intruding in the form of your cat attacking mm -hmm. your keyboard, but also, you know, working at different times of the day to perhaps avoid, you know, little children and things like that. Yeah. Did they have any, you know, tips and suggestions, things that they found were, you know, helpful in dealing with these things? Yeah, so um, trying to, th I think some of the strategies that they had for um, fitting the, fitting work and non-work together are kind of quite useful for us to look at at the moment. Um, and, and a lot of that is about kind of scheduling different sorts of activities at different times, I think. So really small tasks, um, like keeping an eye on something, keeping an eye on your inbox, keeping an eye on the flow of tasks that are coming in, you might be able to do whilst getting on with something else. So maybe whilst, um, you know, stirring a pot on the stove or, um, if your children are busy um, playing with something, perhaps you can go and quickly have a look at something. But to really get on and do a piece of work over that's going to take up some time, uh, even if it's 15 or 30 minutes, you, you need to schedule that. Um, and, and try to minimize the distractions that are going to occur at the same time. But I think one of the things that was really obvious with these people was that um, because they're always on the lookout for new work, it's quite hard for them to really disconnect from work. And this, this challenge with disconnecting is something that people always, or people, lots of people experience when they have email on their phone. So if your phone beeps and tells you you've got another message, you think, oh, I'll just have a look. And as soon as you, you're in there, you're now looking at all of these other things. And so you get this situation where the boundary between home and work becomes really blurred. Like, are you having work time now or is this home time? And, um, and that's definitely something that not only have we seen with these people, but also in some of our other studies that we've done with uh, both academic staff and professional services staff at UCL. So we've seen exactly the same kinds of challenges experienced by those people. Um, 
And we've been able to learn from them some of the things that work for um, creating boundaries where you want to have them and maintaining them. So uh, one thing is to, um, if you're fortunate enough to have multiple devices, then you might think about keeping one device for your work stuff and another device for your home stuff. So whilst we're all at home at the moment, um, that might mean doing something like taking work email off your phone so that you're only going to look at it when you sit down at your computer and you kind of use the device to create this boundary and to separate these different parts of your life. But there are, you can also use apps and accounts for doing this. So if you want to separate your um, work email from your personal email or your work social media account from your personal e um, social media account, then having different apps um, or even just having separate accounts can really help you sort of create those different parts and, and keep them separate from each other. And we were interested to see that um, people who have different boundary management styles, so the, there are some people who quite like to blur the boundaries, they don't mind that at all, and other people who really like things separate. So we were able to see these differences there and we were interested to know whether the practices of the people who keep things separate might be useful for the people who are struggling with boundary management. And we've run workshops and also created some digital resources for people to learn how to implement these strategies. And, um, and the studies we have done so far have, we've used knowledge workers, junior doctors working in London hospitals, and also uh, undergraduate students. And we've seen really positive impacts of people adopting these strategies um, when we've done measures of uh, well-being and boundary management. So these are definitely things that we can learn to do and that we could expect to have some positive impact on how we're feeling. Yeah, that, that sounds excellent. And a really nice kind of concrete suggestion in terms of how to, how to benefit. I'm just wondering, I mean, a lot of this is very digital focused and it's all about being connected. Do you recommend to people that they do like digital detox? Well, digital detox is um, sort of like that phrase really has a kind of negative connotation, I think, because I think it is often put forward by people that think that digital is bad for you. And, uh, and we we see this a lot in the newspapers and so on, telling us that we should spend less time online. And um, I, I think there's very little evidence really um, to suggest that being online is bad. Um, there, um, and I think that what we can do though is to think about the different types of activity we're doing. So one term we see people talk about when they're thinking about being online is this notion of screen time. And that doesn't really tell us anything, right? If I'm on my computer, I could be working. I could be talking to my parents. Uh, I could be watching Netflix, right? So the amount of time I'm on a screen doesn't really mean anything. And I think actually we need to think more carefully about the different types of activity we're doing and the benefits we might be getting from them. So we know that some digital activities are um, really immersive and engaging. And one of the ones that I've spent quite a lot of time looking at is uh, video gaming. So a classic example of something that people like to tell you is really bad for you. Mm. Um, we've done a um, survey study looking at um, the relationship between time spent playing video games and recovery from work and see that people who spend time playing video games tend to have higher recovery from work stress. So we were interested to see whether that was something we might be able to manipulate. And uh, both in a lab study and a field study, we've been able to show that if you take time out to play video games, you're much likely, you're much more likely to um, have a positive recovery from work-related stress. 
So implementing that into your daily schedule might be a really good thing to do. So I can actually tell my partner that that time that I'm spending playing those multi-massive games, that's just fine. It's actually good for me and it's good for my recovery from work. Exactly. And, and particularly, actually, if you're playing with other people, because then you're getting this level of social connection, um, which is really important for us all right now. But of course, I've, I've had to tell my children that playing games is good for them. And, you know, that does lead to some tricky conversations. You must be the most popular mom in the <laughs> That's definitely going to be the case. Fantastic. <laughs> Okay, well, as you know, um, you know, our audience have been sharing their questions as we've been talking and um, and I want to thank everybody who's been who's been sharing questions. I'd like to just go to some of those if that's okay. Is that all right, Anna? Yep. So one of the questions that came up early here is, um, you know, it, is it the case that some people enjoy multitasking more than others? Uh, there are diff some, there is some evidence that some people um, prefer to multitask more than others. So um, there is a, and it is more of a preference rather than a skill, I think. Um, so, um, but I think we can, we, it's one of those things where we need to think quite carefully about what we really mean about multitasking, because really we know that what we're actually doing is switching from one task to another. And, um, and we have so much evidence that this kind of switching is bad for productivity that um, even if it's the kind of thing you like it's probably not a thing that you really want to encourage people to do and is there any truth to this old idea that that women are better multitaskers than men i don't think we have any good evidence about that <laughs> fair enough okay so no excuses good there's a question here from francis who says um i use social media in my work but i find it addictive and get drawn to it away from more focused report writing. Any practical suggestions? Just turning it off doesn't work. I always turn it back on again. Uh, so I think, um, you know, if you, so um, if you're finding that it's like really easy just to switch it back on, then uh, there are apps you can use and things that you can install in your computer that will actually prevent you from going on and, uh, you know, accessing that, um, often for a particular period of time. Now that um, can be useful for some people in some situations, um, but again, it's one of those things where it's just not quite as easy as we would hope it to be, because uh, if you are a student, for example, and you think, oh, or even actually someone working, so often people working, engaging groups on social media, which is all about their work, it might be where they go and get advice about something, and you've blocked yourself from accessing it, then actually that causes you a problem right in the middle of your work. So, um, you know, there are a whole load of um, apps available that you can go and use, but sometimes I think you might be better off just saying, okay, if I keep that, uh, if I keep access to my social media on my phone, and then I'll put my phone a little bit further away from me, or maybe I'll leave it upstairs, and that, that boundary, like that extra effort you have to make to go and get it, means that you have to be sure that you really want to engage in it. So I think little tricks like that can be really helpful. Makes sense, nice little life hacks. So I have a, a good question here that I really like, you know, and they, they've asked, um, what do you suggest for couples when one partner is setting boundaries and the other is sort of mixing work and home life together? Um, Oh, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, I think it is, it's about, you know, I'm, I feel a bit cautious advising people about what they should <laughs> negotiate with their partners. But I think it is about that negotiation, isn't it? Because sometimes if you've tried, if you're trying to disconnect from work and the person sat next to you on the sofa is doing their work, um, you feel sort of dragged into work or maybe a pressure that you should be working. So perhaps negotiating time in when we will be working and time when we won't um, might work. But yeah, that's a really tricky one. And it's interesting in the sense that it, it speaks to differences in the way people see boundaries, right? Like for me, I really like sharp boundaries and mm -hmm. my partner 
is a little bit <clears throat> more flexible than I am, let's say. So I, I really resonate with that question. And it's, it does become an interesting sort of negotiation and uh, communication challenge between us to just sort of make some plans that, that work there. Yeah. But now, now I know I can use my d digital video games as a, as an excuse. I'm happy. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's a question from um, Theodora who says, you know, I'd love to schedule all my meetings for a specific day, but I'm at the mercy of others. Is there any way to manage having lots of meetings um, when you're at the mercy of others like that? Um, yeah, but they but they are things that so there are there are things you can do, but it doesn't. Um, it doesn't always work for everybody. So, for example, one thing you could do if you want to have some focus time without meetings is to schedule the time in your diary. So you've blocked it out. So then no one else can put a meeting in there. Now, if you work somewhere where everyone has access to your diary, you can't do what I do, which is just put an empty block in that time, right? Because people will look at it and think, well, that doesn't say anything. Um, and they might try and schedule stuff over the top. Um, so, you know, you might have to come up with a, a special term that suggests you're meeting someone who they don't know or something. Um, but yeah, just like trying to do that, or if you're in a, depending on what, you know, how, what your team is like or what position you have in that team, you might be able to set up normal practices within your work team so that, Maybe we always say we try not to have meetings on Fridays or something like that. There's a question here from Ritu, uh, my apologies if I didn't quite pronounce that correctly, saying, you know, does having physical boundaries, so separate places to work, have any impact on your productivity? And if so, well, what happens if you don't? <laughs> yeah, so certainly um, having the physical boundary is the thing that, um, certainly in recent times is a very normal way for people to work that they go out to work and they come home now of course within history it hasn't always been like that there have always been people who work from home um, and right now i think the thing that is challenging is that we have been forced into this new situation we're having to adapt to it um, that the, have, because people do find these boundaries often useful, I think when you're trying to adapt to it, you have to realize that that's going to take a bit of time and that you need to find strategies to manage it. So it, if your home is big enough that you can have a space that is just for work, that might work really well. Uh, people use their sheds, um, they use cupboards, all of those sorts of things. Um, if you can't do that, but you still finding it difficult, you know, seeing your computer in the corner, you still feel like this pull to work. Even things like putting it in a drawer, covering it with a blanket, all of those things just to hide it away might be really useful. So definitely trying that physical boundary thing in, a, in the confined space of home might still work. And I think we have time for one more question. There's one here from Elizabeth who said, um, when we do all our work virtually, is there a risk that we miss out on the relationship building chat on the way to the meeting room or to the elevator? And if so, what's the consequence? Well, yeah, so I think um, whilst digital is really brilliant at some things, so we wouldn't be able to do this, right, without digital. It, um, and it does get us really close to face-to-face -to -face communication a lot of the time, but there are things that don't work quite as well. So yes, we definitely miss out on those water cooler moments. Um, lots of people are trying things at the moment, like having coffee together. And I think that's the kind of thing you can try and do. Um, or you can, um, oh, there, you can try and schedule sort of, the walking time, I guess, you know, between meetings, you could try and schedule that and, and have catch ups with people. Um, I think one of the things that's really difficult with the um, online meetings that we're having is that we're often switching from one to the other really quickly. So this one ends and then the next one's going to start in five minutes and trying to give yourself a bit of breathing space, either to be on your own for five minutes or to have a quick phone call before your next meeting, you know, might give us that kind of connection with people. That makes a ton of sense. 
And I should say, you know, my apologies if we didn't get to your question, but sadly we've run out of time. I'd really like to thank my guest, Anna Cox, for sharing her insights and information. I've certainly learned a lot and I hope that others have too. Please join us again next week when we have Professor Nicola Rahani here and she'll be speaking about the onion of cooperation. And I think I at least am very curious to hear how cooperation is like an onion. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks again, Anna. We really appreciate it. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.